to 1 Kings chapter 19, Ephesians 4, and then 1 Kings chapter 19. Praise the Lord. Some of you are kind of subdued this morning. I mean to throw a wet blanket over you today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, how many of you would just, even if it took just an act of your will, would say, okay, I'm going to scoot myself to the edge of my chair. I'm going to get hooked up. I'm going to receive, going to participate, going to respond, going to bring my supply. Hallelujah. And get what God has for me this morning. Amen. Praise God. You know, uh, I've had times even the last few days where just certain things, I've had a really a great week. But sometimes, you know, sometimes you just feel certain things, emotions to whatever puts on you. And uh, you need to learn to stand up in the face of feeling something you don't like and saying, I'm not moved by how I feel. I'm not moved by what I see. I move only by what I believe. Amen. Amen. Over there in Acts 20, don't go there, but in Ephesians, we're here in Ephesians 4, but in Acts 20, Paul lists a bunch of stuff, all the things he'd been going through right then, imprisonment and having to run for his life and all these different things. And he said, but none of these things move me. You got to learn to get to that place. Where you got all kinds of things going on, but you can stand up and say by faith, none of these things move me. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise God. To God. So, amen. amen. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, I spent, I don't know, I got up here about three and uh, five or six hours yesterday praying and studying along a certain line. And uh, I had looked up a certain subject. Uh, it's actually talking about who you are in Christ, our identification with Christ, such a vital and important truth. And I looked and I said, well, I, I hadn't preached on this since early 2012. It's about time to get back to it. Mm-hmm. And so I was going along that way. But you ever feel that's, you know, I know it's a good truth. I know that's vital. In fact, the Lord said to me one time, He said, the greatest source of difficulty in any believer's life is and always has been that they don't know who they are in Christ. And yet I just, you never just, you know, just didn't, hmm. Amen. And so I just went home going, Lord, I, you know, that's a good truth, but I just don't know that that's it. And he said, no, that's not it. <laughs> he said, I want you to minister tomorrow morning on protecting divine supplies. Amen. Protecting divine supplies. You may not even, what is he even talking about, protecting divine supplies? Well, you'll know something about it before we leave here today. And uh, praise God. So this is what he wants. And so, you know, and that joy came and revelation began to come on the subject. And I kind of know, okay, I got it now. Praise God. This is the vein He wants us to go in. Uh And uh, I hope some of you have been praying those five things that you're supposed to pray for your minister. uh, Because some of these things, uh, you know, are hard to say. Some of them are hard to say because uh, if, if it's heard the wrong way, you know, that person that may hear it the wrong way may say, well, that's just pretty self-serving. That's just pretty easy for him to say. None of the things that I'm going to say to you this morning uh, are anything that I haven't been corrected on, learned, taught, and that I'm not diligently trying to practice in my own life. Are you with me? Praise God. Hallelujah. Uh, So we're going to talk about this subject today, protecting divine supplies, or you could say it this way, protecting uh, divine connections. You know, if uh, just think about what you know about the Bible. There are defining moments in these Bible characters' lives. There's defining moments for churches, defining mo- moments for the nation of Israel, defining moments for leaders. And there are defining moments in your life. Now, I believe God's got, He's got a plan for us, as we were talking about last week. Every day of our lives, He's got something for us. He's got a plan for us to walk out. Amen? But there are more critical seasons. And there are opportunities that will come along that are more vital. And it is so important that when those come along, that we get that moment right. Amen. That we get those moments right. Amen? Uh, if you are married or you aspire to be married, you're believing for a spouse, that is a divine appointment. You're just not looking for anybody. You're not just believing for anybody. Amen? But that is a divine appointment in your life. 
Amen? And that spouse is not only meant to be a lover, a friend, a companion, a, a helpmate in life. They are meant to complement you in the plan of God for your life. And you are meant to complement them in the plan that He has for their life Amen. and to bring a supply to it. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. All right, I'm playing a little uh, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Heidi. I was warm and now I'm cool. So would you mind turning that up one degree? <laughs> we'll get it right here. We were moving around and now we're sitting still. So anyway, I appreciate you, Brother Philip. Amen. How, but, I, you know, I could see it. Hopefully we could, you could see this in, in my marriage. Amber is a supply to me. In ministry. And uh, I, I didn't know that way back when. But see, God sees the end from the beginning. And He factors in everything. He factors in stuff we're not even thinking about. When He pairs two people together. Now I'm not one of these people that believe that there's one person out there. And if you miss that one person. No, 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 no. God can bring another person. You know, maybe that person missed it and they rejected you. And you think, well, that's it now. I've got to settle for second best. No, no, no. No, God will choose and He'll anoint and He'll bring about another one. Are you with me? Praise God. But uh, that's just one example of a key relationship in most people's lives that you need to get that right. And then once we come into that relationship, we need to learn to protect that divine connection in marriage. We need to learn to protect that relationship. Amen. See, God is wanting to bring us into divine connections. The enemy is wanting to keep us from them. And once we have them, to divide and separate us from those divine connections. Are you with me? Praise God. Uh, here, just a statement here from my notes. Understand that your blessing, your development, your prosperity is connected to another man. Amen. Amen. And again, if you can't say amen, say oh me. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Understand that your blessing, your development, your prosperity is connected to another man. If you're going to walk out the future, the plan that we got stirred up about talking about last week, uh, if you're going to have that future, you need to understand that you getting into those places and being further down that path is connected to some divine appointments, connected to some divine relationships. You're not going to get there by yourself. You're not going to get there on your own. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, you say, I have Jesus. Well, I have Jesus too. Amen. But uh, let's read something. Did you find Ephesians 4? Amen. Again, this is not the, the subject of my choosing this morning. Although I'm excited about it. Praise God. It's revolutionized my life. I'm not up here apologetically. I'm glad to be here talking about this this morning. <laughs> Glory to God. Verse 4 of Ephesians 4. It says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in how many hopes? One hope of your calling. You know, this is not let's make a deal. All right? You got a call on your life. Discover it, walk in it, or forfeit it. It's up to you. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace, I like to say supernatural ability, was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, here's Jesus. You said, I, I, well, I have Jesus. Well, I have Jesus too. This is talking about Jesus. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, talking about Jesus, he led captivity captive. And what did he do? He gave gifts to who? Yeah. To men. Now, that doesn't mean males. It means mankind. Yeah. Men and women. A lot of sexist people out there that are ignorant of the Scriptures, He gave men and women. Amen. If it bothers you that my pastor's female, get over it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The Bible says in the last days God's going to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh, His sons and daughters, and daughters, and daughters shall prophesy. Now the Baptist will tell you that to prophesy means to preach. So what are we going to do with that? Yeah. That your sons and daughters, if prophesy means preach. Amen. Hello. Amen. Praise God. Anyway, don't be moved by other people's ignorance of the Scriptures. Hallelujah. God's raising up some mighty women of faith. 
Hallelujah. Glory to God in anointing them with tremendous anointings. Amen. And you do well to receive from them. Praise God. That's not my message this morning. Anyway, I gave you that for you for a year. Whatever you want to do with that. He ascended on high. He, gave, he led captivity captive. He gave gifts to men. Now skip down to verse 11. And he, he talks about some of the gifts that he gave. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. You listen to some people and uh, you think that every person in the body of Christ is one of these. Listen, you wouldn't want to be one of these unless God called you and graced you to be one of these. You say, well, how do I know if I'm called to the ministry? Well, go in the ministry and if it doesn't kill you, you're called. (laughs) You think I'm playing. (laughs) I'm really not. (laughs) People, so, uh, you know, I I see it all the time, almost every week, somebody being so loosey-goosey about prophet. Well, they're a prophet, and they're no more a prophet than I'm an astronaut. (laughs) That's not my message either. But the body of Christ is way, the body of Christ is way off in this area. Now, there are prophets, though. There are prophets. And they don't work at Hux. Amen. People that prophesy might work at Hux. People that operate in maybe the Word of Knowledge have gifts of the Spirit flowing in their life work at Hux supernaturally. Right? But that doesn't mean you're a prophet, right? Anyway, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now, why did He give these gifts? I mean, if you've got Jesus and all you need is Jesus, why did Jesus give give these gifts to men? That's pretty easy to figure out, isn't it? He gave them, verse 12 says, for the, uh, for the equipping of the saints. So that tells me I'm going to be equipped through the gifts that Jesus gave to other men. Therefore, other men are involved with me being equipped. Therefore, I need more than Jesus. I need Jesus in the gifts. I need Jesus in the gifts. Are you with me? I need Jesus in my man of God. I need Jesus in my pastor. And I'm going to have that supply. I'm going to stay connected to that supply. And I'm going to protect that supply. That's what he told me to preach on. Protecting divine supplies. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. I'm going to get built up in this process. This is to happen until we all come to the unity of the faith. That hadn't happened yet. And of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. That's not happened yet either. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children. Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the trickery of men. In the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So evidently there is a supply of Jesus in gifts and other men. That is going to protect me from dangerous doctrines. Hello. From the trickery of men in cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. Do you know that there are, uh, I would say, maybe well-meaning preachers, but they are deceitfully plotting for you. They want you around them. They want you with them. They want you giving finances to them. They're not trying to feed you. They're trying to build a following, build their kingdom, grow their ministry. I want my ministry to grow, and my ministry is growing, but that's not the driving motivation of what I do every week. My prayer is, Lord, make me a blessing. I want to be a greater blessing. I want to be a blessing to anyone that comes in contact with me. I want to be a greater blessing to my church. I want to be a greater blessing to my family. I want to be a greater blessing to the ministers that you've already put in my, my, those spiritual sons and daughters that you've put into my life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's my motivation. Praise God. Hallelujah. But speaking the truth in love may grow up. So as I get around these gifts and they speak the truth to me in love, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to you? I'm going to grow up. I'm going to grow up. How many of you want to grow up? Amen. I tell you what, you, de- you, you commit to this place, you're going to grow up. Amen. You'll grow up. Hallelujah. Or you'll get offended. You'll either grow up or you'll get offended. Amen. And the ones that stay around will grow up and the ones that get offended will leave. And so we'll have a church where everyone's growing up. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? 
But do you see, now notice verse 16 says, from whom, talking, oh, let me, verse 15, let me finish that. Speaking the truth in love, slow down, Chris, it's all right. Grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body is joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causing growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. To summarize, that's a mouthful, but to summarize, he's just simply saying Jesus, when he left, he gave the things that were in him. Jesus was an apostle. Jesus was a prophet. Jesus was the pastor, a great shepherd of the sheep. They called him rabbi, which means teacher. He was a wonderful evangelist. Praise God. Right, amen. amen. All of those things with Him and all the endowments and all the graces and all the anointings, when He ascended, He took His place as the CEO of the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. And the CFO, the, you know, the chief financial officer, the, He's the chief executive officer. He's the chief. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. He's the head honcho. Yes. Amen. Yeah. And He sat down and He's running this thing. Mm-hmm. Amen. But He put the gift of the apostle that was in him in some men and the gift of the office of the prophet in some men and women. Amen. And so forth and so on. And that through a right connection with these gifts, hallelujah, we receive all these things. We're equipped. We're nourished. We're protected. We're made to grow. Amen. And that verse 16 tells us that there's a specific place, a joint. I, I'm supposed to be in joint in a certain spot in the body of Christ. I sure appreciate everything, you know, from my forearm down. I sure appreciate my forearm, my muscles, the uh, radius that oh, was it the ulna in there, and all my bones and all the nerves and all that that enables me to do. Amen? But if this got mad at the bicep and disconnected from its joint, everybody's in trouble. Amen? This works when it's connected properly. Amen? And the only way that this works is if it stays connected properly. Amen? It'd be very unwise for my forearm and all the tissues there to get upset and offended with the heart. Because it's the heart that pumps blood that brings the nutrients and the oxygen and carries off all the waste products that are in the arm and all the cells work in there. Amen? We need each other. Could I say that? We need each other. Hallelujah. Understand this. Impartations come from God into our lives through the laying on of hands of those that He has ordained to speak into our lives. You do need, it is coming from Jesus. Amen. And you need certain things in your life spiritually, mentally, emotionally, right? And they'll come oftentimes. Through the laying on of hands. That's why Paul said, I long to see you that I might impart unto you some spiritual gift. Right? Paul told Timothy, hey, stir up the gift. Stir up the gift that you received through the laying on of my hands. Whose hands? His hands. The gift came from Jesus, but notice it came through a divine supply in Timothy's life. A lot of blank faces out there. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Understand again that our future is tied to recognizing the divine supply that He has for us. Amen? Now, I, I, I met Dr. Dufresne through a, a season of real crisis and difficulty in my life. And I, won't, I don't have time to get off all into that. But I, I, brought, I invited him, knowing he was called genuinely to the office of the prophet, into my church because I needed that gift in the church at that time. And he didn't know anything about my situation. So anything that he said or saw or spoke, he, he would have to know supernaturally. And I needed that at that time. My wife and I needed that at that time. And he sure came in and did some things. But see, when he came, I, my wife and I recognized something that our hearts had yearned for. And that was a father. Yes. Amen. Mm-hmm. And you say, well, didn't you have a pastor? I did. But see, my pastor uh, back in Oklahoma City, God bless him, had taken a turn 
and begin to, I'm just going to be bold about it, compromise and really water down. I, you know, and I, what are you going to do? I've already, he already taught, this pastor already taught me the word of faith. He already changed my life with the gifts of the Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And now you're going to go some other way? Oh, no, I'm going to stay with this. Amen. Sorry, I'm going to stay with that. So uh, I, I didn't have that. Oh, praise God, but I knew I needed somebody in my life. And when Dr. Dufresne showed up in Paducah in the pulpit of my church, over the course of just some, uh, some period of time there, I recognized, okay, now this is not just some other preacher. It's not some guest minister we're having in our church. That is my supply. That is my father. Amen. I called him on the phone. I said, uh, Dr. Dufresne, uh, I... I hope this is okay, but I, and this isn't verbatim, but this is just of what I told him on the phone. I said, gosh, I know you're busy and you're all over, and I know that you've got a lot of ministers that look to you. But I said, I, I need somebody, and, and I, I just, I wondered if, I'm not, I'm not going to vie for a lot of your time. I'm not a hassle. I'm a big boy, I, I, you know, I, but would, would you? He said, oh, the Lord's already talked to me about you. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And just, and I tell you what, we came into something we came into something that profoundly affected me personally, uh, changed my ministry, uh, the whole course, the direction, things we're doing today, things we're seeing happen in, th in and through our ministry that we didn't even have an inkling of many of those things before He came into our life. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Oh, praise God. We recognize this is, this is not just some ordinary relationship. This is a divine connection. And we did exactly that. I, I wasn't out to bother him. I didn't call him all the time. I, I wasn't trying to be his buddy. But I said, this is my covenant with you. I'm gonna, I won't talk back to you. I'll take correction when I need it. I'm submitting myself to you, sir. I'm not a baby. If you're within 400 miles of my church, and my schedule will allow I'll be in your meeting and we just stayed with him and we stayed with him till he left hallelujah praise God and we're still we're still st he's not here but we're staying right with right with what he wanted right with that camp right with that company staying right with what he taught us amen and I don't have time to tell you and describe to you how radically fundamentally blessed our lives have been because we came into that divine connection to that divine supply. Amen? Amen? Have you figured this truth out yet that when God wants to bless your life He sends a man? When God wants to bless your life He sends, he sends somebody. You know when the devil wants to mess up your life? He'll send somebody. Teenagers, the devil would love to destroy your life. He's going to send somebody. You know, beware. Be choosy. Don't be quick to trust. Are you with me? Praise God. Listen, some people talk about, well, I want lots of friends. I'd rather have one really good, covenant-minded, Holy Ghost friend than a whole bunch of people that flatter me when I'm around and talk about me behind my back when I'm not around. All sort of stuff. When God wants to bless your life, He sends a man. When Satan wants to hinder your life, he sends a man. Amen? If you don't recognize this truth, you could derail your future. And many do. Because they don't recognize those holy and sacred defining moments when they have an opportunity to get divinely connected. Amen. I recognize that as a divine, holy, sacred opportunity and I took it. Amen. I took it. Amen. Now keep your finger there in 1 Kings, but on the way, stop over with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Thank you, thank you, Marilyn. That's why I got you sitting there. You help me. You pull on me. Praise the Lord. Now a lot of you all bless me. Now notice here, if, how many of you ever read, just, you just read the letter of 1 Corinthians? You just read it. Anybody ever read it? You ever notice that Paul, he's pretty bold. He's saying, oh, all of these people are coming in trying to take you away from me. And you're listening to them. And you're not treating me the way you used to treat me. 
You're not honoring me the way you used to honor me. You're not listening to me the way you used to listen to me. I told you to bring correction to this situation, and I'm finding out that there's sexual immorality going on among you people. And you got preachers coming in, and they're trying to collect you to, them, to themselves. He's just pretty bold about it. Amen? Look at verse, 13, uh, verse 14 and 15 of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. Notice this is what he's about to say is connected to not a frilly postcard refrigerator plaque. It's connected to a divine warning. He says, but as my beloved children, I warn you, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. In other words, he's saying, I'm reminding you, you're my children in the gospel. You weren't even a church before I came to Corinth. <laughs> God used me in my ministry and the anointing all my life to see you born again and raised up and a church established. And all those gifts of the Spirit you operate in, they came through the impartations that I came in this ministry by spending all that time with you. Amen. If I could paraphrase what Paul's saying. And he's saying, now there's an influence come into the Corinthian church trying to pull them away. And he said, I'm warning you, there are 10,000 good instructors, teachers in Christ Jesus out there, but you have not many fathers. Most other translations will say, you have but one spiritual father. You have but one spiritual father. And then he says, I urge you, imitate me. Couldn't you look at that and say, well, isn't that kind of uh, selfish on, you know, on Paul's part to be saying that to them? He ought not be saying that to them. The Holy Ghost is on him to say it to him. I mean, my new, my new dad, Dr. Jacobs, I mean, he was with Dr. Dufresne for 20 years. I've known Dr. Jacobs for 10 years, and he's speaking into my life now, as well as Pastor Nancy. And I'm still trying to, I'm still trying to swallow something he said to some of us ministers Last week, he said, you need to get up in your congregation and teach your people how to take care of you. Yes. Amen. That's good. Amen. Well, golly. Come on. Amen. But see, that takes bold, boldness to do. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So I probably have to do that here sometime soon. Anyway, praise God. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. You see, uh, you receive something through teachers. Thank God for... Kenneth Copeland, thank God for Keith Moore, thank God for all, uh, all thank God for T.D. Jakes, thank God for Creflo Dollar, but I tell you what, nobody on this planet feeds my spirit like Pastor Nancy. Nobody. There's no one on this planet that feeds me like Pastor Nancy. Does that mean she's the best preacher on the planet? No, no, of course not. What that means is, is that she is my pastor. And when I'm hooked up with my pastor, I hear God and I'm fed like nobody else. Amen. How do you know when you found your pastor? You know, right? They, when you get around them, you hear from God real good when they're talking. Amen. It's not about who's the best preacher. And the Corinthians got off into that too, didn't they? Saying, I'm of Paul or I'm of Cephas. He said, no, we don't get off in clicks like that, yet the truth is still true. There are divine appointments. Yes. There are divine appointments. Do you have a pastor? I mean, I got this in my upcoming book. I might as well prepare you for it if you're going to buy it and read it. <laughs> Praise God. You got all these Christians and they love God. They're sincere, but they will not commit to a pastor. They will not commit to a church. Yeah. They won't commit. They won't take on responsibility. They, they won't become part of the family. They will not make themselves accountable. That is rebellion. Yes, that's right. You may not like that, but see it for what it is. Yeah. It is contrary to the scriptures. If you don't have a pastor, you're out of the will of God. If you've not committed, now you've got to take whatever time you need to take to hear from God and to get that right. I, that's, I don't have a problem with that. Amen. But people go decade after decade and they're right. acting like God's not called them to anybody. Right. Come on now. No. That's just not so. No. Amen. Well, you know, Kenneth Copeland's my spiritual father. Oh, give me a break. Give me a break. You, you know Kenneth Copeland? You have his cell number. He has your cell number. You all talk. No, I received from Kenneth Copeland his ministry on TV. Blesses me. His partnership letters. Wonderful. Praise God. Amen. 
But there's no face-to-face accountability there. There's no relationship there. There's no father-son. He doesn't know me. I don't know him. But see, I know Dr. Jacobs, and I know Dr. Dufresne, and I know Pastor Nancy, and they know me, and they have my information, and they can come look in my sock drawer, and they can ask me for my financial reports, and they can dig into my marriage, and they can do whatever they like. That's accountability. And there's safety in that. And I know a lot of people, I've been one of them, burned. My very first Holy Ghost mentor turned on me and tried to prophesy me out of this church. Amen. Still writes me nasty letters today. Still all kinds of stuff he comes against me today. Betrayed me. I mean, just, I mean, might as well, it would have been uh, probably easier on me if you'd have just taken out a knife and just stuck it in and just, I, I probably would have hurt less. And if you've been out there and you've been betrayed by somebody, I understand, but that, you need to get healed. It took me, I had to get healed. Amen. But I so appreciate God brought Dr. Dufresne into my life. He never manipulated me. He never tried to talk money out of me. He he just loved me and preached to me and listened to me and talked to me and spent time with me and was a father to me. And you need that. You want that in your life. You want that in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Still trying to get over to 1 Kings. Let's go there right now because time will get away from us here. (laughs) Whoo! Glory to God. Now, I know that was a bold word when I said that's rebellion, but it is rebellion. And it's a deception. Who is your pastor? <laughs> Some of you, if you've been in a church quite a while, you, you, you know Reverend Jim Hockaday. And uh, I've been talking to Brother Hockaday a little bit. Uh, praise God on Facebook a little bit. And uh, he, he's one, just precious man, knew Brother Hagen, traveled with him for years, taught Bible and healing school, blessed this church. Of course, when we got hooked up with Dr. Dufresne, God said, I want you to focus on, in this family of ministers. And so that's why I haven't had uh, Brother Jim come. And, but anyway, I'm open to have him come, and he, he's asked to come. And, and you know, I, I kind of just joked, just poked at him a little bit. And I reverence him. I mean, he's been in the ministry longer than me. But I said, uh, you still love Jesus, right? <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to find out. My, my point is... Uh, I'm not, I don't bring anyone behind. I'm not going to give my pull to anyone who doesn't have a pastor. Because you don't have a pastor. I don't care how big you are. I don't care how full your itinerary is. I don't care how many cities you go to in a month. I don't care how big your honorariums are. If you don't have a pastor, you're still wearing spiritual diapers. Amen. You know, some of these very people who refuse... To come into a relationship with a pastor. Put on airs like they're the most spiritual people around. And, and they're the ones that want to prophesy to me in the back. Now, I'm not listening to your prophecy. You don't even have a pastor. You're not accountable to anybody. I don't receive your thus saith the Lord. Listen, these are serious and weighty times. They're good times, but they're weighty times. And we need to get, get things straight and get some things right. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. First Kings 19. Take a deep breath. Say out loud, I can take it. This is good for me. I prayed for this. <laughs> Hallelujah. First Kings chapter 19. And uh, we're just going to pick it up. I don't have time to give you all the context. But, uh, you know, Elijah's, Elijah has decided to quit. And God has accepted his resignation and is about to take him to heaven. <laughs> That's absolutely true. And look at uh, chapter 19, verse 19. So he departed from there and found Elisha. Now, in getting ready to go, the verses before tell us that before Elijah leaves, that he's supposed to do three things. He's supposed to anoint Someone is king over Syria, someone is king over Israel, and he is supposed to anoint Elisha uh, as prophet in his place or in his room. Amen? In his absence, you could say it like that. So in verse 19 it says, So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before them. And he was was with the twelfth. So you have twelve teams of oxen, he's on the twelfth team. 
Then Elijah passed by him. Now, how many know for Elisha? He has, that we know of, he's got no idea he's the next big prophet. Elijah knows. Elisha has no idea. For Elisha, this is a day like any other day, he thinks. He's out doing the normal seasonal thing. He is out plowing his father's ground. Are you with me? And uh, verse 20 says, well, no, the latter part of verse 19 says, And he was with the twelve. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. Now, you know, the mantles is what Elijah did all of his miracles with, and it's symbolic of his anointing. Symbolic of his anointing. So here comes the prophet Elijah, and he doesn't say, Hey, you're called to be the next big thing. You're called to be a prophet in Israel. No, he just walked by where Elijah was working and threw his anointing on him. Amen. In other words... In other words, uh, have a little taste of that, brother. How, you know, how, how does that, how's that feel? Right? It says he just walked by and threw his anointing on him. Who glory. How many of you know this is not just any other day now? This is not just some uh, everyday happening. This is a holy and sacred and defining moment in Elisha's life. Are you with me? Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. I lost my place. We just built it up really good and I lost my place. Verse 20 says, And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. Right? Oh, glow! I mean, whoo, what was that? Amen. Yeah. That anointing came. Uh-huh. He'd never had that on him before. Uh-huh. A prophet's anointing. Yeah. A major prophet. Mm. Right an anointing to do miracles. An anointing to prophesy to Israel. Yeah. Was he wise in forsaking the labor of the moment? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you see how stupid and foolish and immature it would have been to go, what was that? And then you go right back to plowing, plowing fields. No, this is, this, is a, this is a make it or break it moment. He left the oxen. He ran after Elijah and says, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow you. Do you see? Elisha's reading some stuff into this. Elijah didn't say, Hey, you're the next big thing, and I'm going to be here a little while longer. You need to get some training. Leave all that and come. That's not what he said. He gave him a taste of the anointing and kept walking. Elisha forsakes all of it, runs after the prophet and says, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold up a minute. Give me just a minute to say bye to my mama and my daddy. Are there, some, are there some opportunities that are going to come your way that are more important than mama? More important than daddy? More important, maybe, perhaps, you have to figure it out, more important than taking on the family business? Who knows? Maybe Elijah's daddy wanted to pass on the farm to Elijah. Who knows? Elijah may have had his course all planned out. He said, whoa, 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 whoa. Right? What was Elijah's response? Elisha says, give me just a second. Give me just a second. And let me go kiss my father and mother. Then I will follow you. And he said to him, well, go back again. What have I done? What have I done? I I didn't do anything. All I did was toss my anointing on you. Amen. Praise God. So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them, boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment, and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he rose and followed Elijah. Now notice this. What did he become? He became his servant. He didn't start prophesying that day. He didn't start doing miracles that day. He didn't. 
You know, he didn't, he's not wearing the t-shirt. I'm, I'm big man on campus now. Right? He's not walking around going, uh, I got the anointing. No. He recognized God had something for him. That it was connected to that man. I've got to forsake everything I've got going on right now. And I've got to go serve him. And all really we, we really know about Elisha until we don't really know how long, but there's some time that went by. And but we see this about Elisha. Elisha poured hands on the, on, the, on the... He poured water on the hands of the prophet Elijah. Washed his hands, washed his feet, brought him his food. Was just with him. Amen. Was just with him. Yeah. Amen. Go to 2 Kings chapter 2. How long should you stay with your man of God? Well, we need to be led by the Spirit, of course. Uh, but uh, how long did Elisha stay with his man of God? Till he left the planet. Right? Noticed Elisha wasn't interested in going out on his own. He was content under Elijah. He was content. To serve the man of God. He was content to be number two. He was content to serve behind the scenes. He just wanted to be around that anointing. Yes, hallelujah. Just wanted to be around that anointing. He was a servant. He didn't have his own agenda. He didn't care about having it his own way. He didn't go out on his own. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, look at uh, chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah uh, went to, with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. I could preach that. Don't have time. But he goes on again and again, city after city. And in every city, Elijah goes, stay here. You stay here, I'm going over here. And every time, Elisha said to Elijah, I will not leave you. Amen. I will not leave you. Why? Because he knew that his future was connected to Elijah. Yeah, God had it for him, but he knew it was going to come through his man of God. A lot of people don't understand this. You know, you think about this, is, it makes me weep, you know. And I used to be part of churches like this. And every few years they vote that pastor out. They vote that pastor out and they bring another pastor in. Not be, there's nothing going on wrong, but they just move those, those pastors from city to city to city. And they, see, they don't have a relationship. They don't have the light. They don't have the understanding of that office and that man and that mantle and that shepherd and what that congregation is to receive. Uh-huh. And knowing they're going to move them out, they don't, they don't let themselves get as attached to their man of God because they know they're just going to move him on. You see, you can't do that in this light when you understand this truth. And uh, so it says, I will not leave you. Verse 3 says, Now the sons of the prophet who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master? Now this is very interesting. Look at the language. These sons of the prophets, they're at prophet school, ministry school. They said to Elisha, the student, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? Notice it didn't say that the Lord was going to take your master from you. It said, I'm going to take him from over you. Speaking about authority. The literal, margin, uh, the literal Hebrew, my margin of my Bible says, from your head. The, those prophets said, do you not know that God is going to take Elijah, your master, from your head today? In other words, today's going to be the last day you're going to be under his authority. Did Elisha leave Elijah's authority in rebellion? Was he offended? Was he familiar? Did he just stop honoring and esteeming uh, esteeming Elijah? No. He stayed with his man of God until God took his man, until God removed him out from underneath his authority. That could come in a command, Mm -hmm. in in a time of prayer. Uh You know, God could tell Kamala and Chelsea... I want you to go to such and such place and and do what I told you to do. Whatever that might be. But you've got to let God do it. 
You don't do it. God does it. I stayed, my wife and I stood with our man of God till he left the planet. And we weren't looking for another man of God. Hallelujah. Are you with me? This is powerful, praise God. He served Elijah. And, uh, but notice, Elisha says, yes, I know it. Shut up. Shut up. So this, the, you guys are just bystanders. Amen? Now, go down to verse 9, because I'm out, almost out of town, time. It says, And so it was, when they had crossed over, that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask. Notice, Elisha did not ask anything about what was in his heart until he was invited. Did you catch that? Elijah was truly submitted. He didn't ask anything for himself until he was invited. I'm convinced that had the prophet not invited him, he'd have just stayed quiet, even though his heart must have burned, burned in the knowledge of what God had for him. Amen? Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Elisha said, oh, when you get a chance to ask, you better ask good. You better ask right. Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit come upon me. <coughs> Elisha, or Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing. You've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken away from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall be so for you. Long story short, he saw it was. He took up that mantle and went out and lived a life and did twice as many miracles. Right? Elijah performed seven miracles. Elisha, in his lifetime, performed 13. He's one short. But you remember those thieves, those bandits, threw a dead guy in on Elisha's bones, and there was an enough anointing in him, that man of God's bones, for one more miracle. Praise God, to fulfill that double portion. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Where did Elisha get that anointing? From his man of God. What if he'd have gotten impatient, offended, familiar, rebellious, ambitious? Right? What if Peter and John and Andrew and John and James in the boat that day, Jesus said, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And they said, nah, I'm not feeling it right now. It says of James and John that right then they left their daddy. They left their daddy. Standing in that boat, left and forsook all and followed Jesus. Now you think, and they followed Jesus, and they stayed with Jesus. Did they get some of Jesus' anointing? In Luke chapter 9, it says that He gave them power yeah. to heal the sick, and over all the serpent, over all the power of the devil, yeah. they got a measure, an impartation from Jesus. What if they'd have not gone? What if they'd have stayed fishermen? Peter, think about his life. What he wouldn't have seen. Right. What he wouldn't have experienced. He would never have walked on water. Never would have seen the loaves and fishes multiply. Never would have seen the multitudes healed. The madman of Gadara delivered. Uh, and amen. And lots of people got connected with Jesus, then left Jesus. But Peter just stayed right there. He said, where are you going to go? Where are we going to go? You've got the word. You've got the answer. You're my man of God. I'm not leaving. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I, time would fail me. All through the scriptures you see it. Timothy got something from Paul. Barnabas was supposed that was a divine connection for ministry, Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas got offended. He got offended at Paul and he drops off the pages of history after that moment, and you never hear about Barnabas again because he dropped off. Do you have a pastor? For the average layman, your man of God is your pastor. You know, in closing, <laughs> that'll encourage you. In closing. <laughs> God does not send families to a church for the youth program. God does not send families to a church because of Sunday school or small groups or because of the style of worship, because of the great nursery or the wonderful pumpkin latte they serve in the lobby. The number one reason God connects a man, a woman, a family member to a church is to have a pastor. To have a pastor. Jesus looked upon the multitudes. He wept over them and calling them 
sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd. Amen? Now you're not in a lower place than me. I'm not in a lower place than my man of God. Amen? But there are divine appointments. There are things in my life I'll never get if I unhook. If I stop receiving. If I leave. If I get mad. If I want my own way. Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Just for the sake of the CD. Listen, you don't receive from people that you're not submitted to. Offended with. You don't receive from these precious holy things. You will not receive from them if you treat them common. Now, I, don't, my, I like my first name. My first name is Chris. I like to hear my first name. Amen? But I don't encourage you to call me Chris because you'll make me common. When you say pastor, you're acknowledging out of your mouth that God's anointed you to speak into my life for this season. And I'm expecting to receive what God's put in you for me. I never... I never you will never hear me go, hey, Nancy. I, it just bothers me even using that as an illustration. Amen. If you're not submitted. Amen? So people will say, well, I'm submitted. Have we had a disagreement yet? You haven't had an opportunity to submit until we have a disagreement. You understand that? <laughs> Amber and I never have to submit to one another when we're in perfect agreement. I want it this way. I do too. I submit to that. That's, no, that's not submission. <laughs> submission is, I want it this way. And the other person says, well, I want it this way. You don't submit till you disagree. <laughs> that's a real challenge for this generation. It really is. But that's why we're robbed of so many precious things. Hallelujah. You don't receive from people you're not submitted to. You don't receive from people. You don't get anointings and blessings from people that you're offended at. Or that you treat as common and you fail to honor. Amen. Mark Hankins said this. It just revolutionized me. I thought I knew something about honor. And then he just totally revealed my infancy. He said, uh, failure to honor is dishonor. You may not think I've done anything overtly dishonorable, but failure to honor what you should honor, failure to honor those that you should honor, is dishonor. I thought, oh my gosh. Then lastly here, how do you protect a divine supply? Number one, remain submitted to authority. I mean, Jesus rebuked Peter right in front of everybody. Called him Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Right in front of everybody. Well, Peter spoke out something goofy right in front of everybody. Listen, you do something goofy and wrong out in public, you ought to get corrected in public as an example to everybody else. (laughs) You mess up in private, we'll keep it private. Does that make sense? Amen. But when you get corrected, hallelujah, stay submitted to authority. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Number two, guard against familiarity. I've been here 13 years, so if you've been with me all that time or most of that time, you've got to really watch it. Yesterday, I'm just out playing football, just having a good time like everybody else. But when, I, when I'm in that prophets, or not prophet, when I'm in that pastors, when those offices are functioning, amen. You got to, that's a holy thing. Amen. And then number three, last one, excel at showing honor. See, this is the kind of thing that makes it difficult for me to stand up here and say. Because I'm not out to get honor from you. And when I hear this, I, I'm thinking about me and Pastor Nancy. I'm thinking about myself and Dr. Jacobs. Amen? That to protect that supply in my life, I've got to stay submitted to their authority. I can't get familiar with them. I can't treat them common. And I have to excel at showing them honor. When you do that, you protect those supplies. I had a lot more I could say, but I'm not going to preach till Eutychus falls out the window. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Paul had 